this year in the United States, we will spend $750 billion to take care of our health. We will spend more money per person than any other country in the world. And yet, with the greatest medical establishment in history, something is going terribly wrong. 37 million Americans have no health insurance. Three quarters of the uninsured are families of the working poor. A million people a year are turned away from doctor's offices and hospitals. Our healthcare system is headed for catastrophe. Tonight on the Health Quarterly, we retrace the journey with Robert Kennedy as America discovered the face of poverty. When I see conditions like this, 1991, 11 people living in two rooms, no running water. I see conditions beyond 1967. And the children of drugs. Is there a better way to help? You're willing to spend $500,000 on this baby after it's born, but you wouldn't spend five or $600 on it before it was born so that it could have been born healthy and not need. And in the AIDS report, the story of a young girl and her best friend, her father. My only wish for Christmas is for my father to be there with me. That's my only wish for Christmas. I don't need gifts. I don't need anything else. Funding for the Health Quarterly is provided by a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Resources making a difference in the health care of Americans. Good evening. I'm Hodding Carter, and this is the winter 1992 edition of the Health Quarterly. When we think of health care, we usually think of medicine, that we rely on it to work miracles, that its cost has seemed to skyrocket. And in this series, we investigate the range of problems and political solutions to the crisis. But being healthy is about more than policy options in medicine. It begins with the basics, food, clothing, and shelter. For some, even these basics are hard to afford. Although we've heard a great deal lately about the new vulnerability of the middle class, the deepest crisis in health care is not centered in the middle class. It's in a place that Robert Kennedy once called the other America. In 1967, he came to my state, Mississippi. I lived and worked there and was as skeptical as anyone else about an outsider, a Yankee, coming to see Southern poor. But when he toured the state, I went with him. What he saw, what we saw, what was there, was another America. 25 years later, we wondered if anything had changed. To find out, we decided to return to the Delta. The Mississippi River Delta, 1967. The people here live and work on some of the richest farmland in the world. And yet, every new generation is born into the same hard life. I grew up here, in the river town of Greenville, with a population of 40,000, the Delta's largest community. As a young reporter in the 1960s, I covered this territory. My family owned the town's only newspaper. Looking back, I'm reminded of just how different the times were in those days. Americans knew there were problems at home, and they wanted change. Our leaders knew it. In a land of great wealth, families must not live in hopeless poverty. It seems so long ago, in but when Lyndon Johnson talked about the Great poverty, Society, I did believe him. Children 
just must not go hungry. In a land of healing miracles, neighbors must not suffer and die untended. Even so, I was skeptical about the motives of the junior senator from New York, Robert Kennedy. He said he wanted to see for himself the face of poverty, hunger, and poor health across the country. A crusade, he called it. There was the trip to the hollows of Kentucky's Appalachian Mountains. How are you? Hello. There was his statement that he was saddened by the appalling conditions and suffering of poor Americans. His visits to Indian reservations made the nightly news. He would go to reservations in South Dakota, New York, and Idaho, where the teenage suicide rate was 100 times the national average. In the troubled Los Angeles ghetto of Watts, where the aftermath of the riots revealed that there were 10 doctors to every 25,000 people, there he was again, walking the streets, looking it over. Then, inevitably, he announced that he was coming to the poorest state in the nation. He turned up here on April 9, 1967 at the Jackson, Mississippi airport. He was traveling with other senators and a few reporters. I wasn't really sure what I thought he was doing. I mean, I wasn't sure whether he was really interested in it as a thing in itself or as a part of his own thing, which was for larger political design. Whatever Kennedy's own interest was, there were plenty of people here who knew what their own interests were. Outside agitators, we called them then. One of them was from Boston's Tufts University, Dr. Jack Geiger. The rest of the country didn't really know what it was like uh, to live in a shack with holes in the roof and a tin stove in the middle and dirt on the floor and a pig underneath to drink water out of the drainage ditch to have a sunshine privy, an outhouse that drained into the drainage ditch so that your kids had infectious diarrhea and dehydration. It was third world. They didn't have contact with the outside world to a very considerable extent, and the rest of this country didn't know about them. When he arrived, Kennedy was briefed on the basics of poverty in the state, food, clothing, shelter, and about the people who were suffering. We followed him as he headed into the delta along the banks of the Mississippi, stopping along the way. The scene was captured by a CBS camera crew with correspondent Daniel Shore. We started early in the morning. It was kind of a damp morning, almost rainy as I recall it, and the whole thing was rather bleak. And uh, he seemed to not have had enough sleep. He seemed at all, at first, uninterested, until we began coming to these sites. And then as he began to see people, you began to see him suddenly open his eyes, lose that sense that he hadn't slept enough the night before, and with some reaction, some mixture of, of shock and concern, suddenly begin to see conditions of poverty, and poor children and children with worms, and, and people who didn't seem to have enough clothing, and these shacks and so on. Do you have lunch? No, you haven't had lunch yet. You haven't had lunch yet? No. And, and, and the only way I can say it as a person who was there for television is being accustomed to see senators on camera with all the necessary reactions. What I had not seen before was a senator who had all the reactions of compassion when he was off camera. It, it really was, it was terribly real. What the trip really did for me was convince me that Bobby Kennedy actually was personally concerned. What I saw was a guy operating out in the field with the folk, with the kids, with the old people, with the poor. In a way which showed to me a humanity I had not recognized in him before. It is a reflection on all of us, the fact that you have uh, young children in the United States at the present time with the wealthiest nation in the world who are hungry and their parents are hungry is uh, completely unsatisfactory. 
what he was saying was that even here in the worst of conditions, the government, Washington, leadership really cares and it's ready to say to the nation, we can't turn away from this either. At the end of his tour through many of the Delta's 18 counties, Kennedy had seen enough to make his case back in Washington. It really was a moment where the gesture of one man made Americans begin to recognize just how deep the suffering was, not only in Mississippi, but across the country. And things started to happen. Within weeks, some of the people Kennedy had seen would be eligible for food stamps for the first time. But at home, state leaders still denied that Mississippi had a problem. We had a group of outsiders came in here and made a great national scene of how many hungry people we had. And Governor Johnson appointed a group of our own doctors. But as I recall, they reported that probably some hunger might be found in Mississippi, but not to a great extent. My thinking is that Mississippi is the best fed state in the whole nation. The state health department, like the medical establishment in the state, the doctors and others, felt ashamed and embarrassed and defensive. Here was this misery all around them that they collectively had the responsibility for doing something about, and very clearly, not enough was being done. Dr. Geiger and others did their best but their clinics could never meet the need. Dr. Aaron Shirley remembers. I vividly recall one night uh, when I was on call and 11 babies died. Diarrhea, dehydration, meningitis, pneumonia, things that babies don't die from. But when they, by the time they got here, they had got, it progressed so that n not much could be done. And that was routine. Shirley and other doctors went out into the state to survey the problem. We looked at people. We put hands on. We saw, we opened it, the shirts and saw, you could see the ribs through the skin. You know, the, 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 the impression of the ribs and you could see the dullness in the kids' eyes. You could see that they weren't active, you know, pot bellies because the muscles were, were weak. That's what we saw. Although official Mississippi was looking the other way, Washington was paying attention. Congress sent enough money to construct this health center in Mount Bayou, the middle of the Delta. Its mission, to care for the Delta's poor. Dr. Jack Geiger ran it. I remember seeing mothers with children with bad infections who were terribly malnourished. And one of the things that we did early on at the health center when we saw that we wrote prescriptions for food, so much meat, so much milk, so much eggs, and gave them to the mothers who took them to the grocery stores, who gave them the groceries and charged it to our pharmacy budget. But you'd look at a mother and give this prescription for food and then realize that she was gonna sit there with five other kids who were that hungry and you knew that they were gonna share it and it was the kind of problem that you came up against all of the time. So with the clinic as a command post, Geiger and others would fight the battle against hunger, poverty, and poor health care for years. The people who lived in these houses wanted more for their children. It was the right time. Civil rights, the war on poverty, not since emancipation did a better life seem more possible. 25 years later, we decided it was time to return to the Delta. We went straight back to the clinic at Mount Bayou, which for so many years was the most accessible medical center for tens of thousands of people in the Delta. The health center is still in operation today, but now it's run by someone who started working here in the 60s as an aide. She came up from the fields of a plantation to get a PhD. Her name is Elsie Dorsey, and now she's the center's director. We picked up people from the plantation and brought them in. For, for many of them, it was the first time they'd ever had a complete physical. The folks start doctor. coming, or you have to reach out? Right? Oh, no. Oh, no, indeed. We had to go get people. They were afraid to come here. 
They were afraid not only of the white, funny-talking people from up north, but they also were afraid of the white people here. In those days, there weren't many local black doctors, so in the beginning, white doctors from the north filled in. Now, like Elsie Dorsey, the staff is mostly from here in Bolivar County. But now it's hard to find doctors who are eager to move to rural places like the middle of the Mississippi Delta. But the need doesn't go away. What kind of load are y'all handling now? Well, on Mondays, we use, like yesterday, I bet we saw 75 people last night. On Mondays, you see between 200 and 275 people. Good Lord. Uh, on Tuesdays, you have a smaller crowd, and you have these people sitting out here, but you also have people around the corner and around that corner. So we see anywhere on any given day uh, an average of 100, 125 well, people. What's your staff size? Do you have the facilities to do it? We, mean, have the have facility. we have the facilities. We mm -hmm. don't ever have enough people because this is rural America, and it's hard. We need three more doctors here. Mm -hmm. um, we lost a physical therapist. We have not been able to replace him. Uh, we lost a radi radiology tech. She died uh, a couple years ago. We've not been able to replace her. Same thing. So it's I mean, very they'd difficult. They'd rather be in a Jackson. They'd rather, they'd rather be, be in a Jackson. They'd rather be in a Memphis. They'd rather be in. A... The center owes its existence to the attention Kennedy brought at the end of the 60s. It flourished under the federal monies that came here in the 1970s. But by the end of the 1980s, the Reagan administration had cut the center's funding by a third. We wondered about another place that was also built precisely because of outside attention a quarter century ago. About an hour from Mount Bayou, just below Greenville, there's a community called Freedom City, where 25 years ago, new housing was built by displaced farm workers. But today, the people who stayed here call this main road right. the street right. of broken dreams. Right. The houses are falling down, and there are no jobs. Mrs. Betty Hoskins lives here with her six children. Five of them have asthma. They get sick all the time, but have no money for medicine. I have got sick many times, and they have got sick many times, and went to dead medicine. We can go and get a shot or something, but we couldn't afford to buy the medicine. I don't see it. No hope for them. And so most of them are just about right back in the same place that they began when they came to Freedom Village, off the plantation. This shack stands on the grounds of a cotton plantation. It's what Ms. Pearlene Smith calls home, with four children and six grandchildren. The plantation's owner lets her live here for free, but there's no heat or water. Sharon Longino is the chief caseworker for Congressman Mike Espy. Hey, Miss Berlin. How you doing? All right. I come back. Don't fall. No, we won't fall, but I came back out bothering you again. Okay. Okay. I'm going to stay here with you. This is 11 of us and all. All of you stay here? Uh-huh. And you have, what, three rooms? It's, I just use these two. It rain all in there, every in there. Uh -huh. Back there. So 11 of you stay in these two rooms uh -huh. here? Uh-huh. Okay. Do you have indoor plumbing? No. Mm -hmm. It's very typical to find families uh, with income of $8,000 a year and less. Families of 6 to 8 yeah. or 10. When I see conditions like this, in 1991, 11 people living in two rooms, no running water, no indoor plumbing. I see conditions beyond 1967. Some of the poor people in the Delta are worse off than they were in 1967. The rest may not be worse, but there are still so many of them. Mississippi's poverty rate is twice the national average. We knew we could find out more at Dr. Aaron Shirley's clinic. He opened it 21 years ago after Bobby Kennedy's spotlight when anything seemed possible. The dream come true for the poor, despite opposition, despite overwhelming opposition by the vast powers of the state of Mississippi. Dr. Shirley's clinic still stands in Jackson, but so do seemingly intractable problems. Every day, blacks and increasingly whites come face to face with the tough choices 
that poverty and sickness force them to make. They stay sick about five or six times out the year with bronchitis and colds and ear infections and different things like that. And I have to pinch my pennies. I really do. To buy milk, bread, just things that you need during the week. It's tough. Once, mostly blacks came here. Now, with Mississippi's economy in its second decade of economic depression, whites are much more vulnerable. It takes everything that my, my husband doesn't make that much. By the time I buy groceries and pay my bills, and if they come up sick, you know, I just have to say, OK, I'm going to take them to the doctor and let the doctor check them, and then tell them I don't have the money. Few of Mississippi's children are actually malnourished or starving, but many are undernourished. Since they didn't get a decent diet, ordinary childhood illnesses become complicated and irreversible. The kids are dull. Uh, they don't communicate. They uh, aren't very active. They don't learn as, as they should. They have chronic undernutrition that eventually leads to uh, uh, repeated infections, respiratory tract infections. And those chronic infections uh, saps their strength. And over a period of time, uh, it's going to cost society because they're not going to be productive citizens. And, whereas, and they're going to cost society in terms of prisons, jails, Dr. Shirley's patients may have uncertain futures, but they are lucky to be able to have a doctor at all. It's more than you can say for many rural Mississippians. Where you don't have facilities like the uh, Mount Bayou Community Health Center, or like the center that we have here, uh, you see people going without until it gets to the stage where they'll end up in an emergency room. This ambulance has traveled 90 miles. Three-year-old Rebecca Graves had to be rushed here to the University of Mississippi Medical Center because she'd been having seizures all day. Hold on, hold on, hold on. She'll be here three days. The bill will be nearly $10,000. Her parents, Tim and Pam, can't afford it. But right now, that's the last thing they're worried about. I don't care if I have to pay for it the rest of my life, you know? It don't matter. And I imagine the medical bills already done, you know, went sky high already. I mean, they had um, already ran all kind of tests on her, with all they could do. They'd done a CAT scan and uh, spinal meningitis, just all kinds of stuff, and nothing Can't showed up. Can't find anything at all wrong. They don't know what's going on. Oh, God. When Dr. Shirley's patients end up in this emergency room, they become part of the statistics. Department head Dr. John Morrison realizes how big the problem is. The, um Infant mortality has been the worst out of all 50 states since they started keeping statistics. The reasons, it ha has, uh, I think, more than its share. Again, the highest rate of unemployment, the highest rate of teenage pregnancies, the highest rate of illegitimate births, the uh, uh, highest rate of medical complications of, of any uh, of the states. Today, the health statistics in Mississippi are the worst in the country. But what's happened here over the past two and a half decades has happened in every state. In the 60s, our eyes were opened. We were, as a country, ashamed of what we saw, but inspired. In the 70s, the federal government invested in food programs, social services, and public health programs. But by 1980, things had started to change. The Reagan administration in particular cut back, cut out of the budgets. No outreach, no family health workers from the community, no environmental interventions, no food supplementation, uh, no health education. 
and said, you've got to be lean, mean, and competitive as if anybody were competing to take care of these populations. And so uh, even the programs that have been maintained because they're of such obvious value, like Head Start or WIC, are running at much lower levels than they should be. About nearly half the women in the country who are eligible for women, infant, and children WIC supplemental food aren't getting it because the states and the federal government uh, say they can't put up the money for it. And that's a tragedy. Part of the explanation is that times are tighter now. But we've lost something else, public commitment and political leadership. And so, sadly enough, the future looks different from this corner of the country than it did when we heard it described 25 years ago. living in hidden places whose faces and names we never know. But I have seen children starving in Mississippi, living without hope or future. And no one, neither industry, nor labor, nor government, has cared enough to help. These conditions will change. These children will live only if we dissent. So I dissent, and I know that you do too. As we've just seen, the past 25 years have not been kind to the poor people of Mississippi, but certainly they are not alone. This country's 34 million poor live in every state. Most of them are neither Mississippian nor black. In every state, poverty is just one of the social problems which has fallen on the back of the health care system. Another such problem is illegal drugs.